All right. Thank you, Doug. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Owen Poindexter, Senior Writer at Front Office Sports. For our next session, I am excited to introduce you all to Hercules Gomez as we discuss his World Cup experience and his second act. After a 17-year professional soccer career, playing for teams in Major League Soccer and Mexico's Liga MX, including representing the United States in the 2010 FIFA World Cup and becoming the first U.S. player to win a Major League so Soccer Cup title in 2016 and Mexico's Premier Division Championship, Hercules joined ESPN as a soccer analyst in January 2017. Now, Gomez and Sebastian Salazar combined to co-host the semi-weekly Football Americas on ESPN+, Plus, a show that has earned critical acclaim for its range and depth in tackling the vexing on and off-field topics in global soccer. Welcome, Herc. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Owen. Thanks for having me. Now, I understand uh, you just got into Qatar, like not like you got in last night, like you just got off the plane, basically. It looks like you made it out of the airport, though. Made it out of the airport. Uh, it was pretty smooth. Um, been here in Qatar for about hour and a half and uh, ready right. to see the sights and get going. All right. Very cool. Well, thank you for delaying seeing the sights by a few minutes to, to chat with us. Really appreciate your time. So let's let's get to know you a little bit. Let's start with your playing career. You played in MLS and Liga MX. What were some of the biggest differences you saw in those two leagues? You know, and that's the question I probably get asked the most. And back then, um, I started playing professional soccer in 2000. 2000. And, and major league in 2002 and, and back then i got a taste of both lower tier soccer in mexico and lower tier soccer in the states and then first division soccer and what is uh, mls and, and liga mekis and, and at that time and those of you who know major league soccer would say mls 1.0 uh, if you will um it was a much more physical league and the differences were physically mls was more much more adept and technically, Liga MX was better. Um, and as the years went on, you saw a little crossover and some change. But technically, Liga MX always stayed better. Tactically, MLS started getting better. Um, and with the money circling in around uh, Mexican football, it, it always just had more talent. It was just deeper. And you could see it in the CONCACAF Champions League runs that Major League Soccer teams would have. Uh, maybe player one through 12 would compete with a lot of those rosters back then. But if you had injury, run of form, suspension, whatever the case may be, just a bad day, uh, it was very difficult to compete. Well, now it's closed. That gap is closed so much that technically they're just as good, Major League Soccer's Liga Mekis. Tactically, uh, a lot more range in, in footballing schemes, if you will. Um, and you're starting to see a crossover. You're starting to see a lot of those stars that were stars in Liga MX come be stars uh, in Major League Soccer. And maybe some of those stars that left Liga MX to Europe, instead of coming back to Liga MX, are now in Major League Soccer. So there's really a fusion of the taste and kind of the past, if you will, between the two. So it's, it's, it's really minimal nowadays. And it's, it's funny because it sounds very easy. Um, and kind of cliche of uh, eventually they will get even, but it's really become that. Um, even with a major league soccer being a salary cap league, they have infused that gap. Yeah, and I feel like that's when you level up is when you stop being the feeder league for for the European leagues and and other other spots. Um, you 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 mentioned the, the term MLS 1.0. And I'm wondering if yeah. there was a moment for you when when it went up to 2.0 when you said, okay, some this is this is happening here like we, we've leveled up into not just like yeah we'll have a soccer league just because we feel like we should to like all right th this is on yeah well it went from mls 1.0 to mls like 0.5 when contraction started right you started losing teams and now you're down at like 10 and you're you're starting to freak out you're starting to wonder where football in the states is going to go and then it's the soccer specific stadium you know columbus that's a step up but it really became MLS 2.0 when the designated player got introduced, and that's David Beckham. When Tim Leiwicki, Phil Anschutz, and the LA Galaxy go and shell out $250 million package deal to bring in David Beckham, and he becomes the first ever designated player, that's when Major League Soccer changed. That's probably the most pivotal moment in my eyes of Major League Soccer when things started taking a serious turn. Um, and now Major League Soccer 3.0 would be you know, these teams that you see, the Seattle Sounders, the Atlanta United, the LAFCs, um, all of a sudden spending the way that back in the day, only the LA Galaxy used to spend. Uh, these pocketbooks, pocketbooks opening up, these players, um, 
of, of marquee value of a name deciding to come to Major League Soccer. And now I think we're getting to a into a territory where you're competing with some of the best setups in the world. I mean, you look at the last offseason, you literally had players leaving Major League Soccer for setups like Boca Juniors, for setups like River Plate, players that weren't being used very much or maybe didn't have a successful year in Major League Soccer were now prime targets for some of the top feeder teams of, of these European setups. So uh, you compete with a huge pocketbook, um, with some of the best teams in the world, uh, and now that setup is changing in the way that the rest of the world sees you. It's still a, a gradual climb, but it, it just seems like we're, we're – every couple of years entering different phases of major league soccer. Yeah. And that Beckham arriving moment is an interesting one. And it makes me think, you know, there's been rumors. I mean, he's, he said it himself. Lionel Messi has said, you know, maybe I'd like to finish my career in the U S who knows if he actually will, but I could see that being like the next big moment, like this attention getting like huge star coming in leading up into that 2026 moment where we've got the world cup coming here. Um, so, you know, we'll see, but there's potentially that, like, I don't know if it's 3.0 or whatever it is. I think gradual climb is, is kind of a steady trend here, but uh, yeah. that could be another like head turning moment. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, parting of the waters, if you will, like David Beckham's uh, signing to the major league soccer was, um, it's either yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo or it's Lionel Messi. One of those two players will be the David Beckham of this major league soccer era because they have that sort of effect. Um, they have that sort of appeal. They, David Beckham came to major league soccer and not only was he selling out at that moment, the home Depot center, but they would go play MetLife. They would go play soldier field. They would go play wherever they went, you know, Stanford university up North here in Cal or when I was in California and it would be sold out. Um, there would be a race for tickets. He was doing the late night circuits, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, Leon and Messi, one of those two players coming to Major League Soccer would have the same effect. I mean, you're talking about all of a sudden an explosion of the sport in this country. And I could tell you that the American fan, and when I say American fan, it doesn't necessarily mean Major League Soccer fan or U.S. men's national team fan, but the American soccer fan here in the States is as sophisticated as ever. And they're dual Nats, they're dual nationals, uh, multiple flags in their uh, social media bios, uh, social media handles, whatever whatever the case may be, they consume the game differently, um, and they pay top dollar, you know, yeah. here in the states, and they want their product. So it would be another watershed moment for Major League Soccer. Yeah, and you mentioned Ronaldo. I hadn't thought of him, but he doesn't seem super happy where he is right now. So yeah, he <laughs> looks like he could be on the move somewhere. Um, yeah, and let, let's get into your your career as a broadcaster. So you you provide broadcast and commentary in both English and Spanish. And I'm wondering if, first of all, if you notice any difference in the reactions you get, depending on the yes. language that you're using, the show you're on. Um, I'd love to hear about that. Also, I'm wondering if there's any diff if different parts of your personality come out, depending on the language you use. I, I, I try to stay pretty even with that personality as, as in terms of you see what you get. You're not going to see me be a different person in Spanish or English. I try to stay pretty even with my personality, with my thoughts, um, because there is a huge crossover uh, a fan base that may have watched me in Spanish and understood and also watched me in English. So you want to stay consistent. You want to be true to yourself. Um, as far as the reactions, it's pretty crazy because uh, I'm one of the few people probably in this market that's going to upset somebody in multiple languages <laughs> and multiple fan bases. Major League Soccer fans would think that I sometimes am too critical of Major League Soccer, the U.S. men's national team, and Liga Mekis Mexico fans would think that I'm overly critical and of Liga Mekis and the Mexican national team. Uh, sometimes without me even being on air, I'll open up uh, my social media handles if there's an Major League Soccer game versus a Liga MX opponent, whether it's CONCACAF Champions League or maybe the U.S. Men's National versus Mexico. And I'm going to get reactions. I'm going to be a trending topic south of the border without even saying anything. Uh, my name will come up. It, it's almost one of these things where I've made a name for myself being that guy kind of in the middle. Uh, and the reactions are... Are, are interesting, um, especially in the U.S. side. And, and they're consistent on, on the Mexican side. They see me as like the anti-Mexico, you know, the, the gringo uh, with the okay. love for the U.S. Oh. But, but in the U.S. side, uh, there's so many different fractions of fandom. Um, 
and, and how they respond, it's interesting because if you have a pro major league soccer take, uh, there's going to be a huge fan base on the U.S. men's national team side that's going to jump on that and be critical of that. And if you're overcritical with this younger generation, there's going to be a huge fan base that jumps on that. There's just so many different ways of, I guess, getting a reaction out of people, especially when it comes to social media. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's how you know you've really made it in this world is when people are yelling at you for literally no reason when you're, you're not yeah. even there. Well, and, welcome uh, to Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's a whole other saga. Um, so, you know, we're as soon as we release you from here, you're out into Qatar to see and report on the biggest tournament in the sporting world that we've got. What are you most excited for here? You know, Owen, it's funny because I, I was uh, fortunate um, and privileged to represent the U.S. in the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. And my experience and what I remember was you'd go from the hotel to the team bus to the stadium training, and then you do a game day atmosphere. And the game day, the actual match day, you remember. You remember the crowd. You remember, like, the feeling, the national anthem. But you don't remember the the cities you were in, you don't remember really the country you were in because you're locked up. This is my second World Cup as a pundit uh, representing ESPN. I was in Russia and Russia was ill-equipped to have a World Cup, but it was amazing. It was amazing being with the people. It was amazing seeing how they celebrate the game. It was amazing seeing, you know, the, the sectors of fans. I mean, so evident. There were three just evident fan bases in Russia. It was the, the yellow jerseys for Brazil. It was the white jerseys with the red stripe for Peru after 36 years of not being in a World Cup. And then the Mexican fans were just out of control. I mean, dressed up in green uniforms, red uniforms, white, black, pink, Aztec warriors, India, Pobla, you know, India Pulana, um, uh, Eagles, uh, Chavo del Ocho, Mariachis, like all these different outfits. It was just a big party. It was a festival. It was a celebration of the sports. That is amazing to me. That is something I'm very much looking forward to in this World Cup. I've only been here in Qatar for about an hour, just a drive up. It's pretty amazing just the infrastructure, uh, how new everything is, how, how it seems like, like this was built for this. You know, um, I've not seen a whole lot, but it already feels like, and I hope it will be the case. I, I hope they let the people celebrate. I hope they let the people be themselves, uh, enjoy themselves, enjoy their national teams. But the World Cup is a celebration. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, I mean, there really isn't anything equivalent in the entire sporting world. Like the Olympics is is not like this Super Bowl, like anything. The, to have all these these different groups, like people so passionate about their country, they will fly halfway across the world um, just to, to watch a few games, maybe. Um, oh, it's, I, it's I ran incredible. into people in Russia. I ran into people in Russia asking me if I had access, if I can sell them tickets to games. I'm like, what are you doing in Russia without <laughs> tickets? And they're like, yeah, wow. I just wanted to be here. I wanted to be at the World Cup, but now I'm looking for tickets. People that would refinance their homes, people that were living check to check, but this is. This is where they want it to be. It's their Mecca. It's their dream. So it, it really is amazing how this sport kind of brings people together. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as, as long as we're, we're talking about Qatar, um, you know, with the World Cup, something this big, there's always going to be off the field stories that that's just inevitable. With this one, I feel like we've got, you know, a lot more than than we bargained for, perhaps, uh, because in part, like like you said, so much of this is new. Uh, when when Qatar got the World Cup, I, I believe in 2010, when when they were awarded the tournament, they had one stadium, and it wasn't necessarily World Cup ready. Now they've got eight. Uh, so, yeah. um, how how do you manage that balance of you're you're here for the games, you're here for the celebration, you're here to see this incredible coming together of the world for this one tournament, but there's also you're also a journalist, um, right? And, and there's a lot more to cover. So. How, how do you find that balance or is balance even the right word? How do you, how do you tell the story? No, you have to tell the story. Now I'm not a journalist, but I, I know that working at ESPN, I have a certain obligation and responsibility. And if something happens or is revolving or surrounding this tournament, uh, we're going to talk about it, especially in our show, Football Americas. We don't, we don't shy away. You have to paint the picture uh, of how Qatar Qatar was awarded a world cup and under what circumstances and, that stadium you mentioned had only hosted a U-20 World Cup. 
and how Qatar actually started snatching up a bunch of rights to different sporting properties because they wanted to package it and make it look good and whatnot and built these eight stadiums and under what circumstances those eight stadiums were built uh, and its human rights track record. Like these are all things that come into play that we have to be honest with our viewers with. Um, and especially if there's probes, especially uh, if there are things going on. I just saw a video that went viral of a Danish TV crew um, that had their camera almost destroyed because they were right. filming just in the street. So we have to tell these stories if and when they surround the actual tournament. We're not going to shy away with it, from that. We, we are ESPN. We're the worldwide leader on that. Uh, Football Americas, we try to be as honest as we can. Sometimes that can hurt our perception to certain entities, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to tell the story of this World Cup, the good and the bad. This wouldn't be the first World Cup under... Um, under this type of circumstance in 1978, Argentine World Cup, you know, Argentina World Cup, the World Cup for their first World Cup, uh, you know, those those stories were told like these stories will be told. Russia, that story was told. Um, we're here to document what we see. We're here to document um, how we feel being participants as well on this side of the coin in this World Cup. We won't shy away from anything. And are there particular things, areas, stories that, um, that that you're curious, excited, intrigued, obligated to look into here specifically? Well, yeah, I, I think just from my own personal standpoint, um, I'm very curious to see how Qatar can host this with their own rules, regulations, laws, without this becoming a fire festival, if you will, if you've seen that documentary, if you know about the fire festival and all that it entailed, uh, I'm very curious to see how that unfolds because it's one thing to say, oh, it's going to be this way, but we're already starting to see a few wrinkles here and there. Um, we saw eight days from the actual start of the tournament. Um, the Qatari government has asked Budweiser to remove tents you know, off the premises of the stadiums. And, and Budweiser is a massive sponsor for FIFA. Uh, how will that be dealt with? And all these different things that that may um, entail. Um, we're, we're ready. Personally, I'm ready for everything. Um, it's a World Cup. You see things you don't normally see. Uh, it, it is a celebration. But with that celebration, people have to act responsibly. And that goes as well for, you know, the, the country and, and the host. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm super excited for the games. Uh, can't wait for them to get started. But I'm also just, yeah, really interested to see how this goes. And you're, you've got a million plus people, some of whom don't even have tickets, apparently, um, coming to a, a country with, you know, around 3 million people. Exactly. There's, uh, you know, not necessarily a lot of room for everybody. So it'll be super interesting. You brought up FIFA. Um, you know, a lot of these issues um, have have put a spotlight on FIFA. Uh, do you think that organization needs to at least introspect or maybe make some changes uh, going forward? Absolutely. Um, I saw a comment from Joseph Blatter uh, maybe like a week ago saying how it was a mistake to give Cutter uh, the World Cup. This happened under his presidency. Where was this when right. he was president? You know, <laughs> yeah. where was this before the investigations and Johnny Infantino and the group moving forward, even the U.S. Soccer Federation, uh, there should be a lot of reflection. There should be a lot uh, to be dissected uh, moving forward. Um, soccer and politics have, I'm sorry, sport and politics have always intertwined. They've always been mixed and even more so with FIFA. Um, and, and there is a real need for reform uh, with the governing body of this sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And um, thank you to everyone who has been putting in questions. Um, I'm just taking a look right now to see what we've got. Um, oh, um, Richard Davis, not a question, makes a good point. He says, I think part of what elevated soccer domestically in the U.S. was the women's success in 1999. Um, and that is an excellent right. point is, yeah, the the men's uh, team has kind of had this steady up and down climb, you know, two steps forward, one step back in the US. The women's team is like the rocket ship. They're like yeah. the stars They're of the, the Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um uh let's see. And um let's see Carlos Chavez again, not, not a question, but another good point. I think MLS has created a professional type of minor league system. Um and yeah, that's been important. Uh, we don't have relegation and promotion here, but we do have uh, a feeder system here, which is um uh, important to, to growing the game and because soccer is so big at the at the high school level here 
um it's you know might be the most popular sport just um for for kids in school um, oh, absolutely youth sport for sure yeah so um all right um okay this will be interesting i don't know if you're um ready to answer this one but it's just an interesting point based on the country and the culture that it's in might bring up some interesting topics. David Handeland asks, what kind of environment will the stadiums provide? Does Qatar have their own version of a Vuvuzuela that we have to be prepared for? Um, oh. <laughs> that was my World Cup, uh, and that was yeah. interesting. It, it got annoying after a while. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I don't know what the atmospheres will be like. Uh, you mentioned it. There's 2.9 million people. Uh, that live in Qatar, uh, there'll be 1.5 million visitors. There's only about 80,000 hotel rooms. So who knows how they package that and deal with that at one time. I know they're doing like cruise ship hotels. I know they're doing like containers. I know they're doing all different types of Airbnbs and apartment. I'm in an apartment right now uh, myself that uh, ESPN um, kind of rented out like these corporate apartments, if you will. So there are going to be different ways of staying within uh, Qatar, but the actual game day experience that's going to be very interesting. Um, good games in the World Cup get great experiences. But in my experience over the last three to four World Cups, you also see a lot of empty stadiums. You also see a lot of uh, half-filled uh, arenas, if you will. Um, it, it's outside of these game day experiences where you feel that World Cup vibe, where you feel you know, the harmony within the people, the mixing and the melting pots. Um, all that kind of thing. But sometimes these game day atmospheres uh, leave a lot to be desired. I hope that's not the case here. Uh, I think having teams like uh, Qatar, home team, um, Saudi Arabia, some of these neighboring uh, places, you may see some real home field advantages for some of these uh, teams. And that could provide great game day ambiance and atmosphere. Um, but I don't really know what to expect. And you won't know what to expect until you're actually there. Russia was something completely different. I mean, it felt like in these little towns that you would have never put anything in, they quickly develop like a center, uh, a, a few hotels, a few restaurants, maybe a bar or two, and a stadium. And there it is. This is what where we were hosted. This is where we will do something. It doesn't feel like that so far, and I've not explored, but so far from what I've seen driving here, it feels very developed. It feels very... Um, it feels very ready for for uh, big events, if you will. Um, but until we experience it, I really don't know how to answer that. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's going to be one of the most fascinating parts of this whole thing is it's just a massive culture clash of like the passion, the insanity of the global soccer world coming to this country that, I mean, I, I don't have personal experience with it and I can't, you know, uh, but has a reputation of being reserved, you know, does not... Um, you know, kind of frowns on public displays of affection. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's just going to be super, super interesting. And it gets into this um, this funny tension with picking a spot for the World Cup because FIFA wants to expand the game, bring this tournament, this massive, massive tournament to new places. Um, but almost by definition, those are some places that aren't going to have, you know, lots of stadiums just hanging around. This infrastructure that you'd want for an event of this size. So, um, yeah, I mean, well, we've got the, the entire thing condensed into this, basically into one city in the surrounding area for this 2026, which will be the subject of our next panel, um, is going to be the exact opposite over all right. of North America. Right. So. Which, but I, I don't necessarily have a problem with uh, it being in so close together. That that could be a great thing. It could uh, be kind of fun. Fans, for fans, you know, um, say what you will, what you your thoughts about Qatar having a tournament or not, but having something centralized where you can go from one metro system, one stadium to another, and it's furthest point is probably 35, 40 minutes. That's massive. I could tell you Russia was a disaster. Um, Sebastian Salazar and I, uh, we had a podcast at that moment, uh, and we were following uh, the Mexican national team and just traveling within the country so massive um, was a headache in itself. And having the comfort of knowing that you can watch literally one day three different groups in the same city and go to every single game and make it on time, probably like that's that's massive. Like what an experience for the fan that that's coming here. To, you know, that for us who are covering it, it's 
it's definitely a lot easier than World Cups in the past that I've, I've experienced. All right. Awesome. Herc, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before you go and we let you lose Santa Cutter, uh, just give us one matchup you're super excited for. One matchup that I am super excited for. Um, let's see. Canada I know you're versus the schedule Belgium. In front. Ooh, no, but all right. Least, yeah. yeah. And the reason is um, I actually think Canada could do some damage in that group. They're a very good team. Uh, they're compact, they're disciplined. They got some very explosive players, very talented players led by Alfonso Davies. Uh, one of the best players in his position in the world who will be playing more of an attacking role with them. Jonathan David, very good nine. Kyle Laren, a very good nine. Uh, Estefan Estacchio, uh, who plays in the midfield, who's got very good vision. John, John Herdman, the coach, is a very disciplined, very well, uh, has a very well-worked well team. And they're going to play against Belgium, who this is their last chance. It's their golden generation, but they're getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, and I think they could surprise. I think they could turn some heads, and I think that's the game for them to do it. So I'm going to pick that game. All right. Very cool. I think you just gave us two sleeper picks for this tournament. Um, Herc, thanks so much for joining us. Um, enjoy, Cutter. We'll be watching you to, to see what happens. It's going to be really, really fascinating. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Stick around. Our next session is coming up in just a minute or two. It'll be on the road to 2026. And thank you so much.